Well, thank you for getting the opportunity to uh, talk to you tonight. And what I wanted to talk to you about was uh, hygiene in the 21st century. Now, hygiene, I feel, has become a dirty word to a lot of people because it's something we should not do anymore. We're too clean now, and we, we really should be a little bit more dirty. But we found in our work, and others have found, that while we've done a good job of removing dirt, the germs are still with us. And the germs, in a way, are still getting cleverer. They have adopted to our changes in our lifestyle in this uh, 21st century. Now, hygiene, as I want to define it here, is germ avoidance, avoiding germs. That's what hygiene is all about. And history has shown us that hygiene has uh, saved more human lives than all the vaccines and all the antibiotics created by mankind. Because you can avoid germs, you don't become ill with them. If I was giving this talk 100 years ago, infectious diseases would be the number one cause of death in the United States today. Now, due to medical advances in that, we saw a dramatic decrease in infectious diseases as a cause of death in the United States. And in fact, in the 1960s and early 1970s, uh, NIH, National Institute of Health, Centers for Disease Control officials claimed that infectious diseases were going to be a thing of the past. We made major advances in vaccines and antibiotics, uh, and they wouldn't be with us anymore. Of course, now, here in, in the 21st century, they're still with us, and they come back with inventions, too. And it was for a number of reasons. We're now plagued with uh, E. coli and skin infections with MRSA, uh, other types of microorganisms and influenza is, of course, the latest right now that we're always discussing right now. So they're still with us. Uh, and they've adapted to our lifestyles, and our lifestyles have changed a lot in the 21st century. Infectious diseases are now the third leading cause of death in the United States. We only die more commonly of cancer and heart disease. So microorganisms are still always going to be with us. And what we've learned in our world is that microbes have adapted to our changes in our lifestyle. Our lifestyle is much different than 100 years ago. We spend 80% of our time indoors today. Uh, we live in bigger offices. We go to bigger stadiums. We go to bigger schools. We go to bigger universities. We go to shopping malls now. And we're sharing space with large numbers of individuals all the time. When we share space with individuals, we share with journey. There's a lot fewer ways for microorganisms to spread very effectively than 100 years ago when everybody was living on a farm and came into a town once a week. When you press that escalator handle or the next time you go to the mall, you realize hundreds of people have touched that and potentially laid down the drug. Now, about 80% of, of all the infectious diseases you are going to get in your lifetime are potentially transmitted through the environment. That's the food you eat, the water you drink, the air you breathe, and the objects you touch. And what I want to talk about tonight is the objects you touch and to some extent the air you breathe. Uh, microorganisms that cause cold, flu, diarrhea are very effectively spread by touching common surfaces and getting the virus or bacteria that causes that illness on your finger. And then you put your finger in your nose, mouth, and eye. Now, the average adult does that about 16 times per hour when they realize they're not. Most of you are putting your finger in your nose about five times an hour by statistics. I can tell you that. Uh, <coughs> without even seeing you, I can tell you that. Uh, but small children do it even more commonly, as many as 80 times an hour. Small children don't even know the food is yet, so they're putting everything in the mouth and the face all the time. And it's been shown a very effective way of transmitting microorganisms that way. If we can intervene effectively in that step of getting the organisms from your hands to your face, you can avoid getting illness. But we have to understand the world we live in and how we're exposed to germs today. Let me start with your home, uh, for example. We've done studies at home. Where do you think you would find the most fecal bacteria? Uh, bacteria that really belong in your dwelling. Well, you find most of them in your kitchen sink uh, and the kitchen area. You find very few in, in the uh, bathroom or toilet area, actually. Which, if I was an alien microbiologist in another world, I'd be very confused about where I should be dropping my pants, your kitchen sink or your toilet. Because there's actually more germs in the kitchen sink. That's always been my theory is why dogs drink out of the toilet. There's actually fewer people back there in the toilet than there is in the kitchen sink. Why is, in fact, there are about 200 times more people bacteria on the average uh, cutting board in a home with a toilet seat than what we find in the Why? You bring in raw food products into the home, raw meat products, raw vegetables, they get in the sink, it's wet, it's moist, sponges, rags, and they grow. They proliferate to very large numbers. Studies have shown. 10% of the sponges in homes have salmonella bacteria, which causes diarrhea. So they're in your home environment. Why is the toilet area so clean? Because Americans are terrified of getting diseases by toilets, actually. They, 
the cleanest object we find in most homes is the top of the toilet. Uh, the same thing in office buildings, too. And if there's ever an epidemic of anything, run to the toilet, drop your pants, and sit on it. Because it's the safest place that we can find. Uh, now, l- let's go to uh, uh, laundry. I always like to use this as an example, too. Your clothes are far germier than your grandparents were. Why? Because they had to use hot water, they used rugged detergent, and we found that that really does a very effective job of killing microorganisms that cause diarrhea and flu and other types of infections. Again. Today, 95% of you are going to use lukewarm water or cold water, and uh, only 5% of you use hot water. You only got to wash for 12 minutes. Average life cycle, you only get dry for half an hour. So, drinks like do that step very easily. Uh, you should be concerned because we found the average load of undergarments have about 100 billion E. coli. You can't see them, but they're in your undergarments. So don't ever wash your underwear with your handkerchief. You're going to blow your nose and what was in your underwear. Uh, so you should be concerned, I think, a little bit more about some good practices and maybe using hot water. What about other environments? We looked at office environments to a, a great extent. Looking at the germs and office environments, so it's a new type of environment. Most of us actually work in offices today, uh, but nobody ever really thought about hygiene in offices until about a decade. And we started studying, we realized how incredibly germy the average office is. Uh, we found that uh, most people don't clean their office desk, but they start sticking to it. And the number of uh, bacteria and viruses we found was really quite surprising. The germiest objects in your office, by the way, are going to be your phone. Uh, your desktop, your computer keyboard, uh, your computer mouse. Those are some of the journeys. Uh, the other area is your first floor elevator button in the building because everybody has to touch it to get out of the building. Uh, so those, when you start looking at human behavior, you start learning a lot about it. Also, computer keyboards tend to become bacteria cafeterias because people tend to eat over them. And when you turn a keyboard over like in New York City, you get a bagel flake snowstorm, by the way. Is it's a breeding ground for bacteria. And these are just changes in our habits and too. It's kind of interesting, too. You learn a lot about people's behavior when you start studying through them. Germiest offices uh, are usually women. They usually have more molds and more bacteria. And then we found that about 70% of all women store food in their desk in the office, where only about half that number of men do. So you get a lot more germy environment. So if you've ever had famine and you try to run to a woman's desk, because there's bound to be food there. This is what I'm saying. And they tend to be more biodegradable foods. Men hide candy bars and bubble gum. You know, you know the latest cake they were making when they were excited to cook and make it work with is left over. So they tend to be germs. Uh, germiest environment uh, job that you would find are usually school teachers. Uh, 20 times more germs, bacteria, viruses in their office workspace um, than any other profession out there. Uh, largely because the kids are turning all their homework in after they sneeze in on it. The cleanest offices are, are interesting enough to be fine physicians, probably because they're always seeing patients and lawyers, because they're probably always playing golf, uh, or maybe in the courtroom. But there is a difference across the spectrum. It's interesting enough that you can find Germany's city uh, in the United States is New York. Uh, if you're afraid you're too healthy, I recommend you to go visit an office in New York. Uh, the cleanest offices are in San Francisco, I mean, for some reason. Uh, the reason why New York offices tend to be more German and as far as you find is that people tend not to go out to eat, the weather's lousy, it's larger buildings, so they can get all the services uh, Or in the areas like uh, Phoenix, Arizona, where it's a nice day, uh, the place to go outside is you have less like, German offices. Uh, so there are trends. Usually your home office, though, is much more German than your work office, that would be surprised that you're trying to do a little bit cleaner, but uh, they're, they're not. Probably because you have different age groups using the offices at home. Uh, what, what about other types of environments you go into where you uh, might actually contact germs? Well, probably the most germy is there. I mean, where are you most afraid of kitchen getting a germ when you go anywhere? Daycare is number one. Uh, is the daycare is kind of because you have younger children, you're together, they spread germs, you know, they cough, they sneeze, and you get diaper changes. That's the germiest area. Uh, you probably ever go into you probably kindergarten at first grade, but you uh, get two or three on that list. But largely, if you study these areas, you'll find cold viruses, flu viruses, viruses that cause diarrhea on the surface of the daycare center. So that's why it's so important uh, to maintain good hygiene in daycare centers. Now, another way of germ avoidance is not to have children, because once you have children, the number of colds and flus you have doubles. 
Uh, if you think you're too healthy, have children. And the more children you have, the more colds and flus you have. Too. So, uh, anytime any children come home with the sniffles, try to give them to some relative as quickly as you can because they do a really good job. And the children track in germs at home all the time. About 90, over a little over 90 percent of all children's shoes when they walk in the door have fecal bacteria on the back uh, of their shoes. So, they're just tracking it all around the room all the time. Um, in, in the toys they play with outdoors usually are loaded with fecal bacteria like, like uh, winning monkey bars. Soccer balls. I'm quite amazing. The cleanest toy we've ever found that children have in terms of fecal bacteria are dolls. So I recommend if you have uh, grandsons buy them a doll because that's the cleanest toy microbiologically you can find that children play with in the young age group. What do we do to try to avoid germs? And that? Is there another strategy that we try to get people to think about what really works in terms of germ avoidance and that? Well, public restrooms is one to look at right away. Because that's one thing we all share. No matter what you're going to do, you're going to have to go to the toilet sometime every day. And we've done a lot of studies on public restrooms, and there's a lot of misconceptions about public restrooms and where the germ is found. Right away, everybody raises their hand. It's got to be the doorknob. Well, the doorknob is one of the cleanest things in a public restroom you can find. Number two, again, is the top of the toilet seat. Why is the doorknob uh, so free of germs? Well, usually, 70 to 80% of the people in the United States wash their hands on the way out. So it makes the doorknob actually fairly clean. The doorknob coming in is easier than the doorknob going out for that reason. So if you want to avoid touching a germ and doorknob, don't touch the one going in. But that's not more germs on it than the one actually touching the doorknob. The other thing, uh, the germ is caught in a in public restroom, by the way, is the uh, sink and the uh, caps on it, by the way. So sometimes I think maybe if you walk your hands in the water, probably. Pick up fewer germs and do that. And again, the, the toilet seat is one of the things. So, you know, one of the things we learned too is that people prefer certain stalls. You know, you study your germs a lot. And you start realizing that most of the germs are in the middle stalls. If you have three in a row, the germiest one's in the middle. And in interviews, we found that most people still prefer the middle stall. So, you want to make sure there's plenty of toilet paper and fewer germs. Always go to the first stall, that's the, the least used. The uh, Germany's toilet you'll actually go into is an airplane because in the average airplane there's 50 people per toilet, right? Unless you're flying a discount airline, you can say, then it's 75 people per toilet. Uh, and it's very difficult to clean your hands and get that area clean. And if the water shuts off, the sinks are small, large men can't get their hands into the sink. So it's very difficult to use it. So that's a Germany's toilet you want to try. Also, those trays are fairly germy, too. Uh, I was at a conference on uh, disease spread and lung transportation, and actually there's really no protocols for affecting uh, disinfection of airplanes and other forms of transportation that's been recommended by public health agencies that they're going to go down. So think about that next time you travel right across. Uh, that's why I'm standing back this far and not really in front, by the way. Uh, they usually say three feet, right, for the uh, that, but I'm not quite too distant to such a large thing. So what do you do? What, what can you practically do to, to avoid them? Well, there's three things we know that works really well from some One is good hand hygiene, washing your hands. Using hand sanitizers is really good, too. And the other uh, is disinfecting key filters. Now, good hand hygiene is washing your hands with soap and water, which in Tucson, Arizona, in, in the public, you find only about 1 in 20 people actually do that. Uh, but you should use soap and water. I find it rather tedious washing my hands as many times as I do, so I tend to use uh, hand sanitizers, which are just as effective. Hand hygiene uh, is a good practice, and we know from studies it reduces your risk of, of getting ill by 30 to 50 percent. So you've got the number of holes, blues, I and mean, yeah. that. The other one is disinfecting key surfaces that you can attach to share all the time. In a recent study we just published in Scientific Journal, we found this by Disinfecting children's desks in school rooms, you can reduce absenteeism by 50%. Because the germiest object in a, in a kid's a school room is actually the desktop. That's one of the most germy areas of fun. The other is the pencil sharpener. And so, my other germ avoidance is buy all of your children you know, mechanical pencils. Because uh, everybody's got to go out there and crank it, right? Number three, if you really want to give the children a message to, is the water fountain. Because if you got diarrhea, you got cold, flu, what do you do? You go into the water fountain all the time. And that toggle gets that really contaminated. Uh, 
So basically, those three tools, uh, I think, uh, are really what we can use today, although I think there's room for innovation and education to really tell people there's a lot you can do to avoid common illnesses that get in contact with every day in your life. And, uh, that's kind of the message I want to send to you. Try to practice and develop some good hygiene habits for the 21st century. It's not really cleaning the world. You don't need any more cleaning. It's just proper good hand hygiene. Walk again, disinfecting just those key areas. Don't become a germaphobe. Just become a little bit germ wise and, and target your activities uh, to minimize the exposure to germs and potential to many people. Thank you.